little change in uh, scripture reading this morning. Instead of uh, Psalm 13, we're going to 150 instead and tell you it's 526. He has risen, hasn't he? It's lovely, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him for according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with triumph, trumpet for sound. Praise Him with the lutes and harps. Praise Him with the tambourine and dance. Praise Him with the string and pipe. Praise Him with the sound of cymbals. Praise Him with the loud dashing flashing symbols. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for that sacrifice you did for us. To die on that cross, a horrible, horrible death. But today we, we celebrate your risen, our risen Savior, that you died so we can have freedom, so we can have the love of you in our hearts, and we can be with you forever. Thank you for all you've done for us, dear Lord, for the blessings you've bestowed upon us, for the wonderful pastor we have. We pray that you would be with him as he brings us again this message this morning, and that many hearts will be touched. We just thank you for, for this blessing. For that puts him on me in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Mike. Well, good morning, everyone. Jesus is alive, amen? amen? Amen. Our gathering here today would be fruitless were it not for that. Uh, Paul tells us in his letter to the Corinthian church that if our hope is only in this life only, if Jesus is erected from the dead, we're going to be pitied above all men because it's foolish for us to worship a, a dead guy. And uh, I just want to read from Matthew's account. Uh, I'll be reading. You don't need to turn with me there unless you want to. Um, Matthew chapter 28 verses 1 through 10, and read about the empty tomb. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen. He is risen as he said that he would. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Let's pray. Father God, we uh, come before you today. Some of us have entrusted our lives to you. We have bent the knee. We worship you as the one living God. We, even though we can't quite get our minds around it, submit to and place ourselves under by the will that you've given us your blood sacrifice that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We accept by your grace the righteousness that you earned as you walked 33 years on the planet without sin, which you impute to us. And we believe you are resurrected from the dead. We believe the tomb was empty. And not by the nefarious counsels of men who hid the body or stole the body or what have you, but because you overcame death above all for the glory of the Father, but to bless us, to bring us, we who believe in you, your inheritance with you into your kingdom, that we might, as we sang today, rule and reign with you. But you are the King. You are the Savior. You are our hope. You are our life. Apart from you, we can do nothing. And for those who don't surrender to you, those who refuse to call you God, those who refuse to bend the knee here on earth, they'll be separated from you for eternity, just like they want to be. 
But I pray today, Lord God, as the, as the gospel message goes out, not in this church, but in churches around the country and around the world. Around the world, your people are proclaiming the risen Savior. I pray that these words, this gospel message, will fall on ears to hear. And that the flesh of people's hearts will be fertile soil that the seed can take root in and blossom up into salvation and abundant life. I pray that today for those who don't know you, that they won't walk out of here not knowing you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. If you want to <clears throat> turn with me, the first place that we're going to be is the Gospel of John chapter 3. And we'll be in verses 1 through 8 in just a moment. The Gospel of John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. It's two for one Sunday here at First Baptist Church. <laughs> if you look in your bulletin, you'll see a bunch of scriptures and a sermon outline that I'm not going to preach. Um, I put it in there, and you can ask my wife. I have been grumpy all week because <laughs> the message, I get that way. When the, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not happy. I'm not happy with the message. And she's like, you'll do fine. I'm like, I'm not worried. I know, I, God's gracious, but it's all God's Word. It's good. It's, uh, it's a freebie. You take it with you. You read it. It'll lead you right to the cross. But I was just un unsettled. <laughs> uh, so you're going to hear a different message than the one that's in here. If you have questions about the message that's in your bulletin, please feel free to call and ask. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. It's all about the resurrection, but I don't know. I hesitate always to say God told me or God laid on my heart because I think that seems presumptuous. But I want to preach this one. So that's what's going to happen, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let God have it. So there's three things we're going to look at today. The, the, the product of the resurrection for us, the benefit of the resurrection for us. Uh, one, it's three things, and, and they'll be on the screen. You don't have to take notes this moment. The first is that we're able to be born again to a living hope. The second is that we, that's proof, his resurrection is proof that we've been purchased or bought by Christ. And third, his resurrection is the promissory note that we are blessed beyond measure. And those are the three things we're going to look at today. The unfortunate thing is that for most of America and most of the world and most people, this resurrection story is nothing but a fanciful myth made up. I don't know. I talk to a lot of preachers. None of us are getting rich. So I don't, I don't know why we would make it up. Some are getting rich, but... You'll usually find the really, really rich ones. They're not always preaching the gospel. You've got to watch. Sometimes they are. But we don't preach this message to get rich on earth. We certainly don't preach this message to gain favor with men. Men will hate you for this message. If you, want to, if you want men to love you, preach about them. Preach about all they can do. Preach about all God's going to give them. Preach about what God can turn them into and turn their struggles into victories and their poverty into richness and their sickness into health, that they just have enough faith. Preach that and they'll love you. But to preach a Christ crucified and risen isn't going to gain for you the love of men. And by men, I mean men and women, people. But the world is terrified of death. Hebrews tells us this. Men who are bound and, and in slavery by fear of death. And, and you know it's true. There's a gym on every corner. Amen? We're trying to work our way out of death. We're trying to stay young as long as we possibly can. I see commercials. I'm tempted by them. Hair club for men, right? What if, what if I was the one guy that it wasn't obvious if he did that? What if I was the one guy? <laughs> all the bald guys are laughing everyone else is afraid to think you might offend us you won't offend us we know we're bald <laughs> plastic surgery is one of the biggest selling items that doctors do these days you see actors and I dare I use the term actress right? from back in the 80s and 70s and you see them in their prime and then they make movies today and they try and look just like they did then but their eyes are like this their faces are all, you know, and you're like, come on. haven't you seen pictures of other people that had that done? I, I don't want to call any names. Some of my favorite actors have done all that massacre to their bodies. If you are on Facebook or you're on Instagram, you can see bodies crafted by surgery being flaunted for money. 
we work and toil at our jobs to provide for our families because we know that one day we won't be here. And we want to live well while we are here. And we know our time is short. God's written that on our hearts. We know our time is short, so we work and we struggle and we worry for our kids. I worry for my son. Am I going to be able to provide an inheritance for my children and my grandchildren, like Scripture says? We toil. We abandon God's house because there are things that we have to do on the Lord's Day other than be here to make money, to enjoy ourselves, to enjoy the days that God has given us, especially when the sun starts to come out. Amen? I can worship God anywhere, we say, and we go out and proceed to not worship God anywhere. <laughs> we're on the lake, we're in the woods, we're on the beach, we're in our backyard, we're working on the deck, whatever it is. Now, those things aren't sinful. But we want to make beautiful, and, and, and if I'm lying, I'm dying, like Wolfman Jack used to say, we want to make beautiful things that are temporary. This world is temporary. My family's temporary. I'm temporary. My mortgage isn't temporary. I can't figure that one out. Everything's temporary. Everything's fading. Our beauty's fading. Our strength is fading. If you're over 50, your ability to grasp words, isn't that fading? Your kids walk in and are like, hey, um, uh, um, uh, you. Death, although it's common to 100% of people, is unnatural. That's why we hate it. It's the way of the world. It is the way of the world, but it's the way of this world because it's corrupt. In the Garden of Eden, God didn't intend. If Adam and Eve had just obeyed, there wouldn't have been physical death. Death is the result of our disobedience. Death is the result of us worshiping something other than Yahweh, the one true God. That's why we all die. 100% death rate. But God provided a way that we need not die. We were doomed, every one of us, from conception. Doomed to die apart from God, out of good relationship with Him, as His enemy. Because of our rebellion, our self-worship, our refusal to even read, let alone abide by His Word, our refusal to, our refusal to worship Him. And we all do it. I'm, not, I'm talking about me too. We all, we all do it. Setting priorities higher than Him. For the Creator and Sustainer of the universe, that is a huge insult. That's a crime against God. And we commit crimes against God every day, whether we're born again or whether we're not. We take His name in vain. We lie, we covet. I'd say that's probably the biggest one. Of all the Ten Commandments, all, every one of them has to do with coveting something other than what God has provided and what God has given. So we're all guilty, and we all need forgiveness. That's what the world doesn't believe. That's why they call us fools for coming in here today. That's why some of you who are drug here think it's foolish to be here. You think, and really it's a self-preservation thought, I'll never have to stand before God and give an account. And then you believe the lies of the non-believers. What type of loving God would hold you to account? But one day, when you breathe your last, you will stand before a big, great white throne with Jesus on it. And he's going to weigh your life in the balance of perfection versus what you did. And there is not a one of us sitting here that isn't guilty of falling short of the glory of God, but let's be honest, just blatantly sinning against Him. It's a, it's a game we can't win. It's a price we can't pay. Once you sin, it's too late. If you've sinned once, that's it. The wages of sin is death. You already owe. Now you owe. 
But this loving God said, I will provide a way. I will be the sacrifice that's needed for my people to be forgiven of their sins. I'll do it. They can't. They can't live a perfect life. Scripture says God knows we're but dust. We can't live a perfect life. He knows this. You know it, if you're honest. But Jesus Christ, and if you're a Christian, you must believe this. If you don't believe this, then you have no concept of who Jesus is or what he did. You must believe that Jesus, from conception until the time that we nailed him to that cross, did not sin once in thought, in word, in action, or in action. He loved the Lord his God with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength every moment of his existence on earth. He still does, because he's alive, amen? He's alive. And he truly loved his neighbor as himself. What is the greatest example of Christ's love for his neighbor while he lived? It's that he spoke truth to them. He didn't worry about their feelings. He didn't worry about where they were in life. He told them the truth. Why do you think he hung out with whores and drunkards and sinners? Because only the truth can set you free. And don't think he was sitting with them partying and drinking it up. I saw a meme, Jesus was a party animal. He hung out with drunks. And I just wanted to rip the two hairs that I have left out of my head and gouge my eyes up for looking at it. Jesus was not a party animal. He was the unblemished sacrifice for their sins. And he went to them, and as he spoke with them, did he show them love? Yes, but he told them the truth. He didn't abide their sin. He told them the truth about it. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And he told Lazarus, his sister, I am the resurrection and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus, in his resurrection, paved the way for you to be born again. And let's read uh, right here in, in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Jesus is talking. He's still on earth, walking and talking. This is before the crucifixion. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And the man came to Jesus by night. And he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus had been tearing it up, feeding the, uh, feeding, uh, just miracle after miracle. Verse 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now that's on the heels of this guy telling Jesus, you must come from God. I, we see the wonders that you do. Does Jesus go, yeah, believe the wonders. Yeah, believe the signs. He doesn't say that to him. In fact, this response is almost not related to the question, it seems. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? It's the kingdom in which God rules. It's the kingdom in which God reigns. It's the kingdom in which His people bend the knee and worship Him. Gladly. Gladly, saints. Amen? Not in fear that He's going to smite me and smoke me, but because He died for me. He paid my price. He is worthy. Worthy. Amen? We worship Him because He's worthy. We don't worship Him in terror, though we worship Him in fear, which is respect. Nicodemus said to him in verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In order to be born again, God must regenerate your spirit. God the Holy Spirit reaches in, 
You're dead in your sins and trespasses, Scripture tells us. And He reaches in and He creates in you a new spirit, a living spirit. And Deb, it'll be up on the screen for you. And we read about this in Titus 3, 5. Titus 3, 4 through, 4 through 7. 5 in there. Here we go. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Who saved us? He saved us. Not because of works done in righteousness. Wow. <laughs> what? Hey, let's read that again. He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. Oh, so you can't earn your way. Amen? You'd have to be perfect to earn it. So not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to what? His own mercy, He saved us. He had mercy on We're guilty, but He had mercy on us. How? By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That is what it is to be born again. You don't earn it. You don't get into heaven because you deserve it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be grace, would it? It'd be your wage. God would owe it to you. God, I've been to church. God, I came to church. I listened to that guy talk for like 40 minutes. He went on and on and on and on and on and on about the empty tomb that I don't even really believe in, but okay. Doesn't that win me a little heaven point? No. You can't win or earn glory. You can't win or earn heaven. You can't win or earn eternal life. It's a gift from God by His grace to you. And He will pour out His Spirit richly on you and change your heart of stone into a heart of flesh and give you a new spirit. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 21 says that you're a new creature. The old has passed away, the new has come. How? Verse 21, He who was without sin became sin so that you might become the righteousness of God. Jesus paid your price on that cross. Will you accept it? Will you allow God's blood to wash over you and cleanse you? Folks, that takes worship. You can't just say, I want that and nothing else. For God's blood to cleanse you, you have to be His slave. We don't like that word, do we? I'm gladly his slave. You're a slave to something. You're a slave to yourself in sin, which is the devil, or you're a slave to Christ. Which is it going to be? If it's not Christ, you'll be separate from him forever. But what does it mean to be a slave to Christ? What else does Christ call us? His bride? His friend? His brothers and sisters? Slave to Christ doesn't mean you got a chain around your neck tied to a wall somewhere. Slave to Christ means I have come so that it's not my life that I live, but yours. I have come to lay down my life because it's worthless and to live for you. I have come to serve in your army. I've come to be in your family. Adopt me. Lord, adopt me. Make me your own. Why? So that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heirs of what? Heirs of the kingdom of God. Now that's a slavery I can buy into. You will rule and reign with Christ. We sang about it this morning. You will judge angels. You will judge Satan. Satan. On that great white throne judgment when the lost and dying world that refuses to bend the knee to Jesus Christ is standing before that great white throne, we, the, the masses of His people, the body of Christ, washed in the blood of Christ, redeemed by His blood, the vicarious righteousness of Christ emanating from us, the, the glow of the holiness of God just emanating from our bodies. If you saw your resurrected body, you would want to fall down and worship you. And we will be standing there pronouncing the judgment on those who refuse to bend the knee to Jesus Christ. Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, every disbeliever on the planet 
who refuses will be in that line being condemned. And we will stand with Christ judging as heirs of the kingdom. But that comes at a great price, you guys. Not for you. Well, it does cost you everything. Right? It's not I who live, but Christ lives in me. That cost me everything. And Jesus said so much. Count the cost. If you thought you were going to come in here today, I was going to say, hey, just say this prayer and you're good. You can get that anywhere on YouTube. Church down the street tell you that. What did Jesus say? He who follows me must count the cost. He must lay down his life daily pick up his cross, and follow me. There's no get-out-of-hell-free card, folks. There, there just isn't. When Jesus converts your heart and gives you life, you love him, you follow him, you serve him, you deny yourself because it's just the flesh, and you embrace the things of God. And that's a lifelong process. And it's a joyful process. Isn't it, saints? Saints? But it's a hard process sometimes too, isn't it? I mean, laying down your life ain't easy. Putting to death the deeds of your flesh aren't easy. It hurts a little sometimes. It hurts your ego because you can't really do it well. It hurts because you're now missing things that you once loved that were sinful. But the blessings you get, which we'll talk about on the third point, So we're bought by Christ. That's the next thing. We're born again. New mind, new spirit, new hope, new goals, new view, new world, new worldview, new. Born again by the power of Christ. But we're bought by Christ. Let's look at uh, John chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Bought by Christ. Think about that. God bought you. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man, that's Jesus, be lifted up. That whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. What does it mean that they lifted up Christ, saints? What happened? What's that called? Crucifixion. That whoever believes in Him will have eternal life. We toil away in this life trying to save up our little sum, trying to do our little thing, doing our push-ups and our jumping jacks and our burpees and everything, trying to stay, you know, But that's not eternal life. Your eternal life starts the moment Christ saves you. You start living for Him. You have a reward you can't even imagine just because He saved you. You're an heir with Him. And the good works you do in His name build up more reward for you and more reward for you. So it starts now. It doesn't start when you die. But when you die, what happens? Saint, you shake off this sinful body and you get a new one. Amen. Not prone to sin. No sin nature. A a body built to serve Christ for the rest of eternity. A body built for worship. A body built for service. A body built for the strength of the Holy Spirit. A body built to do what God has called you to do without reservation, without question, without falling. And for eternity, you'll be serving Him in some capacity you can't even imagine how great it is. I don't even know what it is. I'm not saying that I do. But you won't be floating around playing harps and eating grapes. That, that you won't be doing that. I, that. I'd be bored in ten minutes with that, probably. Amen. Anyone? I mean, I got to sit on a cloud. And just, yeah. But that eternal life is going on for the rest of eternity. If you're born again. Let's keep reading here. For God so loved the world. Verse 16. Everybody ought to know this one, right? If you watch sports, you know this one. For God so loved the world, that's everyone in the world, that He gave His only Son, His one and only, His unique Son, you could say, that whoever believes in Him, that's trusts in Him, should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. 
Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. Amen. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Folks, we are born condemned. And if you don't pledge your allegiance to Christ the King, Christ God, Christ the Son, you're condemned already. Unless there's someone in here that can raise their hand and honestly say they haven't sinned, not once. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, verse 8. Wow. Why? Because we're purchased with a great price. If you'll turn with me, uh, well, let's look at verses 35 through 36. We need to capstone this. Verses 35 through 36. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. Therefore, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The wrath of God against what? The wrath of God against sin and sinners. The justice of God. When you see what's going on in the world, does it make you mad? Some of it, not all of it. So there's lots of good in the world. When you see things, do you get angry? When people lift up things that you know are an offense to God and, and proclaim that these things are righteous and good and really to worship God at all is wrong and bad, do you get angry? I do. How dare they? How dare they? Who do they think they are? Well, they think they're God. That's the answer to that question. They think they'll proclaim what's right and wrong. And whoever's up there will be good with it because they believe something. God has a wrath. If you get angry, you're a sinner. Imagine the, angry, the anger of the holy, righteous, perfect God who wrote that rule in the first place. You can't even imagine it. As angry as you get, as righteous, I'm talking about righteous anger. I'm not talking about hissy fit, tantrum anger. If God was throwing tantrums, none of us would be here. Amen? Who's seen a kid throwing a tantrum in the grocery store just landed? If that's the type of anger God had, well, we'd all just be nuked. But God says, love your enemies. Even though you're an enemy of God apart from Christ, does He not love you? Does He not give you the sunshine on a beautiful day? Does He not give you nice weather? Does not He give you fish to pull out of the lake? Does not He give you chocolate ice cream? I always use that one. It's my favorite. Does not He give you someone to love? Does not He give you enjoyment doesn't he give you pleasure he sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous why because he loves his enemy but make no mistake you are his enemy unless unless you're purchased by christ let's see what we can do about this let's go to colossians 1 19 page 983 in your pew bible if you're in your pew bible it's page 983 Colossians 1.19, starting in verse 19. This is Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. And like I said, it's page 983 in your pew Bible. Let's read verses 19 through 22 of, verse, of chapter 1 of Colossians. For in Him, that's Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's a whole other sermon. Jesus is God. Okay, verse 20. And through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. Remember, I said we're born enemies of, of Christ. Enemies of God. How does God make peace with us? We don't make peace with Him. He makes peace with us. Can you imagine it? You think, I gave my life to Jesus? Yeah. No, you didn't. He moved first. He saw a world that hated Him. And he said, I'm going to save some of them. They'll never come to me. I'll go to them. That's exactly what Christ did. I'll go. I'll go. You think, he, well, I don't really want to go. I'm not sure if I want to go. No, no, that's not Jesus. I am going to go and redeem my people. And as many who will confess me, I'm going to bring them with me into my kingdom where they will rule and reign with me. They're my inheritance. I'm going to go purchase them now. And he came and he died on a cross for me and you. 
We said it before in this church, we say it a lot. Jesus Christ, the manliest man you've ever seen. He wasn't some wimp. He wasn't whiny. He didn't go digging in his feet. You've all had kids that do that, right? Come on. Right? They got feet dug in. Maybe you hate that. <laughs> That's not him. He made peace between God the Father and you through the blood of his, his cross. His cross. You know the hands that were nailing the nails into Christ, that Christ had formed those hands in that mother's womb? Do you know that all those soldiers that were standing, it's about 600 of them, standing around mocking him, beating him with reeds, jamming thorns down on his head, hitting him with those things that, that ripped the flesh off of his back so bad that you could see his spine and his ribs from the back where they were flagellating him? Do you know he knitted all those people together in their mother's womb? And that while they were abusing him, he was holding them together with the word of his power. His power held them together. He could have made their arm fall off when it went back like this, couldn't he? But he didn't. He set his face towards Jerusalem. He set his face toward the cross. And he says, this I must do to win my people and nothing's going to stop me. I love him. I've never followed a leader like him, and I've never known a man like him. I love him. I love him. I would follow him anywhere, through anything. And my wife and I have followed him through a lot of things that have hurt. You'll never find a leader like that, ever. What does Christ lead you through? The wrath of God. Where's the destination? Friendship with God and glory. No man can do that for you. Let's take a look. If you turn the page, maybe you have to. Uh, chapter 2 of Colossians, verses 11 through 15. Chapter 2 of Colossians. Now we're going to see how he makes peace with his cross. For those who are born again, for those he saves, that's who these verses apply to. Starting in verse 11. In him... In Christ also, you who are saved, you can put that in parentheses there, were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In other words, you don't have to look up here. In other words, when Christ saved you, He separated your sinful flesh from your new spirit. And here we go, verse 12. Having, buried, having been buried with Him in baptism in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. And here we go where he's going to purchase us, right? And you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses. How? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Folks, you've committed crimes against God. When God opens the books on Judgment Day, and many of you have read it in Revelation, the book of the law, the book of your works, the books are going to be open. He's going to, hey, what have the works been done? How, how many, have they done good works? Have they done perfect works? You're going to find that you owe God for your sin, and it's a debt that you can't pay except through an eternity of punishment. Death. Spiritual death. God, for those He saves, took that bill of debt that you owe God, He took it out of your ledger, He nailed it through his hands and through his feet on that cross he went to for you. And he stamped a cross it in his own blood. Paid in full. Paid in full. If you don't accept Jesus' blood sacrifice for you, you owe whatever's on that ledger. And the wages of one sin is death. What do you think is going to happen when they roll like this roll of toilet paper down the aisle and that's all the sins that you've committed? Folks, you're on the naughty list. I, I, don't, know, I don't know how else to say it. We're on the naughty list unless, unless Christ redeems us. And His blood is more than enough to pay for your sins and mine. Won't you accept that? Won't you take that?
Last but not least, we're born again, we're bought by Christ, but we're blessed beyond measure when he buys us. We're blessed beyond measure. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. That's page, what, 1014 in your pew Bible? 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 3. 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 3. First Peter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us. <laughs> it's all Him. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why is it so important that Jesus is alive? Because when you're born again, you are placed in Him through faith. As long as He lives, you live. Hebrews tells us, we are saved by the power of His indestructible life. Hebrews 7.16 His indestructible life. When He stops being God, when He stops living, those of us who have trusted Him will also stop living. Folks, that day will never come. We are saved by His life. That's why, I hate to even use the word Easter. That's why Resurrection Sunday is so important. That's why if the tomb's not empty, we're doomed. If Jesus is dead, we're doomed. If He can't stay alive, how's He going to keep us alive? Amen, right? But He doesn't just barely save us and then put us in the doghouse like, yeah, hey, I barely saved you, you nitwit. Look at this. Verse 4. What's he save us to? To an inheritance that is imperishable. What? Undefiled. It's unfading. It's kept in heaven for you. Who, who, who are you? You're the one who by God's power is being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Who's guarding your salvation? Who's guarding your inheritance? God is. Amen. Don't you want him guarding it? Say this prayer, not, no, I'm, not, I'm not saying say it out loud. I'm not, at some point, God, thank you that I'm not in charge of keeping my inheritance. But thank you, thank you. Thank you that you're guarding my inheritance. Because I would be the prodigal son, amen? I'd go out, nah, da, 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 da. I'm going to go see what I can do with this inheritance. And then all of a sudden, it would just be a train wreck. Because I've been in a lot of train wrecks. I mean, anyone else have been in a lot of train wrecks? <laughs> And I'm the engineer. Doot, doot. You know, pulling the... Just, there we go. <laughs> Verse 5. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You will be glorified, saint. You will get a resurrection body. Verse 6. In this you rejoice. And we should. Amen? Though now for a little while, and this is our life on earth, it's just a little while. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Notice that. You may have overlooked that in reading these Scriptures before. Are your trials just arbitrary? Are they just to hurt you? What does Jesus say here? In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Whatever trial you're going through, God is using that in your life for something great. All right? He's using that in your life for something. The de oh, the devil's just been attacking me. Yeah, but not unless God lets him through. That's God's devil. He can't just come and attack you and hurt you unless God allows for him to do in your life what God's going to use. What it, what's the Old Testament say? What you intended for evil, God intended for good. All right? All things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. Even your trials have a meaning. But if you don't know God, no, they don't. You have, no, no one's in charge of this. Your trials have a meaning. And look, verse 7. Why? So that the tested genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and the glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's when you get your reward for your faithfulness. That's when you get your reward for your endurance. Verse 8, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not know, now see Him, you believe in Him. Saints, this needs to be what you believe. You haven't seen Him, but you love Him. 
You don't see Him now, but you believe in Him. And you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, which is the salvation of your soul. Jesus is alive. He came in flesh as a man. He didn't fake it. He came as a man. And lived a perfect life because you can't. And died a sacrificial death so you don't have to. And if he hadn't come out of that tomb, none of that would have mattered at all. But the scriptures tell us that that he commended himself to the right hand of the Father. And your, Father, in your hands I commit my spirit. That he, he went and professed to those who were in Gehenna in, in the place of the dead. He went and professed to those who were in prison, claiming his victory and, and, and claiming his victory. And then he, is, he assumed his resurrection body. Assuming again his rightful place in charge of everything. And Ted told the angel, roll the stone away. And the angel did. And did he zoom up to heaven to start waiting for our prayers to give us our Cadillacs and stuff? No, he he didn't do that at all. I have a Cadillac, but I'm going to use some other car next time. No, he spent 40 days with his disciples training them to develop the church. Telling them, build my church, feed my sheep, go get my people. And then he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And that message of Come to Christ has been the call of the true church since that day. Can everyone stand with me and the musicians come? The call of Christ is the same. Come to me, you who are heavy laden. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I will pay for all your sins and I will give you riches beyond measure. Just come to me. You may have to suffer for a little while on earth, but don't worry. That's got a purpose. It's for my glory. And isn't that really what you want? If you've never surrendered or bent the knee to Christ and you want to talk about it, I'll be up here. We'll talk. We'll talk. If God's working on your heart, come. We can, we can talk. If too many people come and I can't do it, then we got deacons that can come talk to you. If you want to come lay something on the altar, you can come pray at the altar. You can pray in your seat. But if the Holy Spirit is at you, don't deny His voice. Don't close your ears to what He's saying. Respond yes as the music plays.